Watch the entire video my lovely viewers, I mean from start to finish, to get the whole thing. Without wasting much of your time, let's get right into it. Hi lovely viewers, it's me again, your one and only Mtati Mpundu. Welcome to my YouTube channel. If this is your first time on my channel, kindly subscribe to my YouTube channel by hitting the red subscribe button down below and turn the bell icon to join the notification squad. Don't forget to like, share and leave a comment. Tell me what you think about this video in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you lovely viewers. Very angry Fred member uh, who accused President Hichilema of abusing his power to try to break down, you know, your spirit and using the police service to harass you as a political opponent. How are you doing? How are you recovering from last week's incident? I don't think I was at any stage very angry. Mm. That's not in my nature. Uh, there's no need to be angry about what is happening to me uh, because it's something that is expected. Uh, that has been the nature of our politics. I don't know when we'll get out of it. And when you become very angry, you stop reasoning. Uh, so anger should be something one manages very, very well. And I don't think I have the right to be angry for such a long time. And mm. it doesn't pay. After your release that evening, you claimed that President Hitler attempted to intimidate you, asserting that such tactics have never worked uh, in any you know, regime uh, in Zambia, and it wouldn't affect you. What leads you to believe that President HH really is the mastermind or personally responsible for your arrest? I mean, he's got a lot of problems before him to fix an economy. Why would he be concerned about Fredman? He said it. <coughs> when that incident happened in Serenje, he was very quick to comment on it. Before even knowing what the facts were, he commented. He said when he was in opposition, he never carried down any arms. So as far as he was concerned, I was in the wrong. Even before he heard what the true facts were. So this is the continuation. He's in charge of the police. He's the commander in chief. The police reports to him. He's got even the, the deputy IG at State House, who is very active as well. So he can't wash his hands from it, no matter how much he tries to. These are not independent actions of the police. And we are dealing with the police. You can see how troubled those human beings, who they are sending to arrest us, charge us on the matters that they know don't deserve that merit. One of the comments you made after your release was that uh, you were thanking the men and women in uniform who were at pains to really arrest you for something they did not believe in. Were you merely politicking or there is evidence or proof that the police have told you that they are being sent to do what they believe is not right? It started with the arrest in Serenja itself when this incident happened in early, early April, the police were there. They released us on bond. The charges were put. The, the charges that they had were not the charges that were put yesterday. And we talked to police officers. We live with the police officers in our communities. We interact with them. We go to the same churches. We have family members in the police. We have friends in the police. We have relatives of our friends. We have relatives of relatives and so on. It's not a closed community. What is happening now in the police, everybody knows. The police officers are not happy themselves with what they're being subjected to. What is happening in the police, Dr. Member? You see it every day. The abuses which we thought would end with the PF have continued. Sadly so. Speaking for myself, I expected a bit much more better from this regime in terms of the abuse of the policy. As I've said before, those who administer the criminal justice system 
in any country. And it has shown throughout history hold the power with the potential for abuse. If you don't have restraint, you abuse the police. Our politics are increasingly being centered around the use of the police to deal with political opponents. I don't think it has worked in this country. It didn't work in the colonial days when the Kaundas were being detained. It didn't work in the post-independent days of the Kaundas. It didn't work under the Chuluba regime. It has never worked under any regime. Let's deal with politics politically. Let politics be dealt with by politics and not by the police. The police are not the best instrument to play politics with. Certainly, as we analyze the 24 months of UPND's, you know, uh, tenure in office, um, the UPND, and like you've rightfully said yourself, uh, were elected on the backdrop of the restoration of, you know, the, the rule of law and order, um, thuggery, caterism, and maiming of political opponents and cadres was actually the rule of the day under the PF administration. Um, one of the things that President Hichlema did strongly talk against, he himself was arrested uh, on treason charges that were later quashed under Enole. He himself was you know, stopped many a times from holding public meetings and gatherings. And so his administration, even when he goes to parliament, he'll be opening parliament as soon as that they have managed to restore the rule of law and order, removing cadres from public places such as markets and bus stops, giving citizens, whether opposition or like, the freedom to associate, the freedom to assemble, and so on and so forth. Wouldn't we say that there's a bit of an improvement in comparison to what existed two years ago? What is a bit of an improvement? Mm. How do you measure that? What people are looking for, what the Zambian people are looking for, is not a bit of an improvement. It's a huge change. Wrong is wrong. <clears throat> a bit of wrong is not good enough. Wrong is wrong. We need to live in a better way. The things that Mr. Hichilema and the UPND were complaining about, especially about the Public Order Act, the freedom of expression, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of association, the freedom of speech. They have been violating them. It mattered to them because they were involved. I'm starting to believe actually that they opposed all things not out of principle, but out of personal political interest. Because if it was out of principle, they would have done away with those bad practices. They were bad under the UPND, uh, under the PF. They are still bad under the UPND. This weekend or yesterday, the PF was denied to hold a rally. The excuse was that there are no enough police officers to deal with the situation. But look at the, the manpower that they mobilized, the police force that they mobilized to police in Galumi. It was far more than what was needed to police a peaceful rally that was going to be organized or run by the PF. It is simply they didn't want the PF to hold a rally. Yes, the PF were not good on the public conduct. But we voted. We changed the government to have a better society than that which the PF gave us. We all have grievances against the PF. I have my grievances against the PF. But we are not trying to build a society that it takes us back to the PF, to the bad things, to the things we abhorred under the PF. We don't want that type of society, but we want a better society. A society that is based on fairness, justice, and humaneness, not on vengeance. Yes, what the PF denied us should not de be denied them. If we do that, we'll have a vicious cycle that will never end. The UPND will not rule forever. There will be a day when they will leave government. Those who come in government start doing the same things to them that were done by the UPND to them. Where are we going to end? But as a, as a political scholar and a player yourself and as a scribe, why 
should it take us this long as a country to practice intellectual politics and clear-cut democracy of just the exchange of ideas. Why should people like yourself, 50 years after independence, have to carry a gun in order to practice politics? Uh, carrying a gun is not just about politics. Mm. If you go to the police headquarters, the gun section, gun licensing section, you will find thousands and thousands of names of people carrying guns. Not only those in politics, but even people in the church leadership, farmers, businessmen, and ordinary people carry guns. It's not just a few people carrying guns. I've carried a gun since 1976. I was introduced to guns in the proper sense since 1976. From 1978, I've carried a gun. Not only in this country, but also in other countries where I've lived. I've never shot anybody. If you go to the U.S. today, many citizens carry guns there. You which, have is, which, the gun which, which is a big, big problem, and they're battling it, with gun legislation. Yes. You go to the U.K., people carry guns. You go to South Africa, people carry guns. You go to Brazil, people carry guns. They license guns. Is that a culture not, you want to see in Zambia, where it's, everybody it's, carries it's not, guns? It's not a culture. Mm. It's not a culture. What matters is the use. The police don't just dish out guns to anybody. Your character, your background is looked at. It's looked at. I've carried a gun since 1978. You have never heard me shoot anybody. There's nobody who I shot. I was your neighbor here. You never heard gunshots of me shooting somebody. Mm. You never even probably knew that I carry a gun. It's not something that you exhibit. And the uses of a gun in this, in this country are very restricted. You don't use a gun anyhow until, unless you are in, a, in extreme, extreme danger. And we were in such a, a situation where firing of shots in the air was needed. Not even at aimed at anybody. Nobody was aimed a gun at. You, you've been charged for causing, you know, assault resulting in actually body harm. Did you maim anybody? Because part of your comments, again, you, you, you say you're a trained sniper, so if you intended to maim, surely uh, you would have done that. Yes, I'm militarily trained. Mm. I'm militarily trained. It's not a secret. Even now, as I'm talking to you, I'm still a reserve of the Zambia Army. Mm. I have not been uh, retired. I was supposed to have been retired a long time, but I think out of neg ne ne inefficiency. I'm not retired. I've carried a gun. I've, tra I've been trained to use it. And because I'm properly trained to use a gun, I don't use it anyhow. That's why you have never heard my name of having shot anybody. Uh, we had to shoot in the air to save lives. Not only my own life, but the lives of so many people who were involved in the scuffle. It was there. We were attacked by European decaders at a place where we are supposed to be as per the ECZ timetable, campaign timetable in Serenja. We just saw people coming with the sticks, the stones, the catapults and chains, whatever, attacking us. It was a bit, you know, frightening. If I didn't fire those short, two shots in the air, somebody would have been killed. And you saw this, the pictures of some of the people, how they were injured including our only person, Jinyama. He was very, very injured. He still carries big scars. So, so, so as a player, with all the comments that you're making, what would be your ratings as far as the promises to restore rule of law and order and really to free the democratic space two years down the line under the UPND? What would you say? Uh, you know, these are not just issues that affect people who are politicians or in politics. <laughs> they affect ordinary citizens. Talk to the ordinary people, how, feel how they feel. Because the media is also just concentrating on what we, who in the politics, feel about what has happened over the last two years, how the UPND has governed over the last two years. Talk to ordinary people, get their feelings. Maybe you know our own feelings, you know our own judgment, our own analysis that political persons may be biased. But the people who live under these conditions every day can tell you.
But even us from the, polit from the political side, we practice under this environment. We can tell you things are not easy. Things are not easy with freedom of expression. Things are not easy with freedom of assembly. Things are not easy with freedom of speech. We have not seen, probably even under the PF, we have not seen so many arrests on a weekly basis as we are witnessing now. I don't, be, I don't believe people in the politics have suddenly just become very bad people who the police should be, should be arresting every day. They are good citizens. They are well-mannered people who are being arrested. And also there's bias. You are attacked by a European decada. The person who will be arrested is the one who has been attacked. So how it has we, happened to us in several we, places. How do we strengthen the professionalism and autonomy of our police service? The participation in the governance of the Zambian people is important. What a politician respects, what a politician fears is the people at the end of the day. But in our country today, people's participation in the affairs of the, their country is very low. It's very low. Voting, yes, is important, but it's not the only way of participating. People need to participate every day. People need to own the governance system. As I've said before, in Bemba, we say, When you take away people from governing, from Okuteka, things don't go well. We say leaders lead, the people govern. And indeed, they must govern. Only the people can govern it better than anybody else. Mm. For, 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 from time immemorial, I remember the drive came, you know, so rapidly uh, under, you know, President Michael Satter's era of legal and judicial reforms. The MMD had a bite uh, on this. Let me ask something that you probably are more enlightened than I am. Issues to do with, you know, the ATI and the FOI, 20 plus years are these some of the reasons why we can't have fully fledged free speech and, 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 and freedom of, of, of the media? Look, we the media, we worked on the, project, the media project for many years, pushing these uh, law, legal changes, constitutional changes. I think the media today is operating under more difficult conditions than we did. It's sad that that's the situation. And it has made the media very weak. We have got a very weak media today. Added to these freedoms is also the economic environment under which the media operates today. It's very difficult to run a media organization today. The economy is not supportive. The financial system is not supportive. News costs money to gather. News needs expertise to gather it, to process it, to transmit it. How much are our media organizations making every month? Where does the money come from to gather the news to pay the salaries and so on? That in itself to me is a much bigger blow than anything else. It compromises the media houses. Survival is the order of the day. Strengthening news gathering, strengthening new professionalism in the news gathering, news editing, news transmission is weakening. The emergence of the online publications, the platforms that are there, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, and so on, are taking away money from the media. Advertising is gone. The television doesn't have sufficient advertising today. The radio doesn't have sufficient advertising today. The newspaper doesn't have sufficient advertising today. Because all the advertising money is going to Google, it's going to Facebook, it's going to WhatsApp, it's, and so on. So with, with, with that said, does, in a sense, traditional media still hold its position as the watchdogs of society or the fourth estate of society 
and, and, and back again, how do we then bring semblance to a democratic society to keep political power accountable as a weak media? This two, this two refer to the media as the fourth estate. The first estate is paid for by the taxpayer. The second estate is paid for by the taxpayer. The third estate is paid for by the taxpayer. The fourth estate is not paid for by the taxpayer. But it's expected to perform. There is a need to fund the media. There is a need to assist the media to survive. It's still very important. The fact that any of us, you know, today can throw something online and it trends is not a substitute for news gathered by professional journalists, processed by professional journalists, transmitted by professional journalists. Mm -hmm. Killing of journalism is <coughs> endangering society. Some of the conflicts that we see arise from poor news getting to the people. What is being trans transmitted to the people, what is being fed to the people, is not proper news. You have got a publication that even those who publish them are not known. There are no addresses. They defame people. People can't go and sue them. Some of them are close to those in power, and they are protected. Even Ezekta will not help you because the publications are run from state house. You have the watchdog, you have got Kosu. It's an embarrassing situation. Mm. But that's not media. That's not news media. That's not the media that can hold polit political leaders or, and other leaders accountable. It's not only the politician who should be held accountable. All those who wield power, political, economic, religious, and otherwise, need to be held accountable for that power that they exercise. We don't have a media today that we need to do that job. The media is increasingly becoming weaker and weaker and desperate and desperate. Mm. Back to the ATI question. Last week we saw that again uh, roundtable consultations you know, had started with various stakeholders on the issue of the ATI. Again, a scenario which has taken over 23 years. Uh, drafts have been done. It's at the stage of cabinet. Do you see this happening or merely these are cosmetic approaches? But, but by and large, we get draft constitutions again right at the tail end of something being implemented. Either it has been mutilated, the Public Order Act, it's very clear even when you look at um, court precedences and rulings that have been made on, on, on the fact that it is not the job of police to issue a permit, but to merely provide security marshals and so on. Uh, Laz has debated this issue. So why do we fail to actualize even things that are very clear cut in our laws? It's sad on the Public Order Act. I was the first person to challenge the Public Order Act in the High Court in the early 90s, represented by State Council John Sangwa now. And the matter was before High Court Judge Lombe Chivesakunda, as she was then. <clears throat> the judgment that came out was not clear, was not conclusive. Then came the Mulondika Unipi case. I went to prison for one month. I was detained in Chimbokaila for one month. After the MMD moved away, from the judgment of the Mlondika case in the Supreme Court, trying to legislate against it. I opposed that, I denounced that, I questioned that, and the parliament locked me up on powers that they did not have for simply challenging what they were trying to do about the public order act. The public order act is still being abused, is still being what it was then. It's sad. How many people should be arrested over the public order act for it to change? So we keep the it the people, way it is because it benefits those well, in power? Yes. How else can you explain? Look at how the UPND suffered in opposition as a result of the administration of the public order act. You would have expected them 
to remove that law. We promised in the run-up to the 2021 <laughs> elections that if elected, there is no debate. The first law that will deal with will be the Public Order Act. We'll simply repeal it. There is no need to amend it. There are enough laws to protect the public, to maintain public order. We don't need that act. I, I think then the challenge for the citizenry is whether social contracts are signed or we merely cast a vote for believing in that party's ideologies and promises. When the parties are elected, they you turn and it's the citizens that lose out because these promises were equally made by the UPND. And apart from the POA, what we've seen them quickly rush to do is remove the death penalty as well as the defamation of the president. The death penalty did not affect anybody. When were people last executed in this country or hanged? It's a law that was not being implemented. It didn't affect much in terms of implementation or the killing of people. Yes, it's a good thing to remove it completely, but it's something that had no effect. So why did we rush to do it, to, to have a good because it had public no, image? it had no political impact. It had no political consequences. It did not affect their hold on power. Defamation of the president. When you look at defamation of the president, it's a deception to remove defamation of the president and then you maintain criminal libel or criminal defamation. It's a deception. And what is also not captured by the, 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 the repealed law of uh, defamation of the president is still captured by other laws. You have all sorts of crimes now that are picking up that. So again, it's another deception. There's nothing that has really disappeared. What has disappeared is just a name because the whole thing is incorporated in other laws. You're still being charged for the same things. Let's take a look at really the economic, you know, hardships. Uh, one of the biggest issues and this current administration has actually accepted through their government spokesperson, through their party spokesperson. I think, again, it was last week when you made the comments after your arrest that government through the spokesperson did answer you, saying, you know, President Hichilema is more concerned about bringing down the cost of millimil than having you arrested. Let's look at their performance vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the high cost of living. Um, in the last, you know, one year, 18 months, in, in the one year, eight months or so, uh, the, the UPND have introduced this monthly review of, of fuel pump prices, which makes it difficult for business planning. They've gone high. Millimil is a very, very thorny issue right now in the kitchens uh, of, 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 of homes, 305 or 310 kwacha, depending on where you're buying it, uh, a bag of millimil. What would you analyze as the reason as to why the cost of living has gone you know, so high? Every economic decision has winners and losers, especially in a class society. They are winners and losers. If you want to maintain a certain level of fuel prices. You want to remove the subsidies. There will be those who benefit. And who are the beneficiaries, the main beneficiaries? It's the business groups <coughs> that deal in fuel. Those who are dealing in fuel today are making more money. And we know that for a long time, fuel procurement in this country has been a source of corruption. Successive regimes have benefited from fuel procurement. Kickbacks have been there. Today, who is supplying fuel? Who is running the pipeline? And so on. How, was the, how were the tenders awarded? And so on. You will find that, you know, there is a link to some people in power benefiting from that. Maize, what is causing a shortage of maize, a shortage of meal meal? 
It's not that we didn't harvest enough. We have enough. What is causing that also is the export. The export to some of our neighboring countries of maize, of meomeo itself. I always ask and argue, Dr. Membe, if we are harvesting in the surplus and DR Congo needs to buy maize from our country, surely what is wrong with that? But why don't we regularize the exports of maize when we have a surplus? There's greedy. You have a surplus of, uh, say, 500,000 tons. You are going to export 1 million tons. You have a problem. And who is exporting? The exporter of maize, of meal, is not the poor peasant who suffers, who breaks her back to grow that maize. The people who are exporting maize are people who are nowhere near growing maize, most of them. Well, the, the easier analysis also could be that it's an input versus output scenario. I mean, you're an economist. The cost of growing even an acre of, or a lima of maize in this country is just way too high because of the inputs that go into it. So yeah, do we expect the price of millimil to be, to be lower? It's not only the cost of the inputs that determine the cost of production. The efficiency, the effectiveness of your methods also matters. How much are we harvesting per acre? What is the production per acre? in terms of the, the tons of maize, about two to three thousand tons. That's too low. That's too low. You need to work on increasing the productivity per hectare. If you don't, the cost of production will continue going high. Our cost of production is not only because of the fertilizer that are expensive, we need to put in a bit more in terms of extension services, in terms of research, and so on. There are even places where fertilizers are used to quantities that are not necessary because the soils are good. There are also regions of our country that are not fit for maize production. <coughs> the cost of producing a bag, a, a bag of maize, a 50 kg bag of maize in Western Province is the highest because of the nature of the soils. It's lowest in Muchinga province, second eastern province, and so on. You need to rationalize mm. this. But equipped mm. with such you know, knowledge, you know, Dr. Memba, I know that you studied uh, yourself issues around seed and so on. What the Zambian people are looking for are solutions from leaders you know, such as yourself. If the UPND have failed, you can't advise them because for an ordinary viewer, you know, watching tonight, Dr. Membe, they care less about the seed variety. They care less about extensions. So they care more about a bag coming down from 300 kwacha to 50 kwacha like they were promised. People are sleeping hungry. You are right. People are sleeping hungry. You are right. We can theorize. We can have all sorts of ideas in our heads. They are of no value. What people are looking for is not the heavy theories we carry in our heads, the ideas we carry in our heads, what people are looking for is an improvement in their material conditions, in their living conditions. They want to live better, and they want to live in peace. That's what they are looking for. How that is done, it doesn't matter much. They want it done. Yeah, so how do we bring down the cost of a bag of milk? You know that food is the primary thing for the existence of the human being. You need to invest more in it as a society. It has to be a priority. It has to be a priority. It can't be a by the way. It can't be a by the way. And there is no country in the world where agriculture is not subsidized, where governments are not paying maximum attention to agriculture. Even the USA, the USA has been subsidizing agriculture for many centuries. 
For over 100 years, the USA has been subsidizing milk production, just milk production. You have heard of wheat being dumped into the sea, bought and dumped into the sea by the government, just to protect the farmers and so on. We need to pay attention to agriculture. Look, it's very easy to say no subsidies to agriculture and the people starve because the prices of food go up. When people start you know, falling ill because they have not been fed, I collapse here because I've not eaten. Are you going to leave me in this studio? You will take me to the hospital. The cost of taking me to the hospital, either yourself or calling an ambulance, is a high. So we're putting, we're putting the, the blame on, on the removal of, of subsidies. I mean, this is not the first time we're attempting to do that. Uh, the PF under President Sata also, when they came in, tried to do that. Or are we in a situation where we'd let our people go hungry because we need to satisfy conditionalities of this debt restructuring under the IMF? Look, it doesn't matter what method you take. What matters is you being able to satisfy the food needs of our people. If you can satisfy them by, with the removal of subsidies, go ahead. If you have to put in subsidies to satisfy that, you still need to go ahead. Because at the end of the day, no matter what you do, people have to eat. They have to have food at the end of the day. But one can You not, have yeah, yeah. the unit that is dealing with the emergency food reliefs and so forth. What is it there for? But Dr. Yeah. Mand, one can not fathom to believe that as a country, we do not have technocrats and experts who surely can fail to sit around the table and crack this challenge where the price of milibu is just escalating. Just last week again, I was baffled to see that in, in, in about 24 hours, the PS in the Ministry of Agriculture issues a release or a memo that they were banning, whether it was the debuying or, or movement of maize from one district to another. Before we were trying to even understand what that meant, there was a reversal to that statement. Are, are we shooting in the dark? Uh, well, what's going on? <laughs> we have enough expertise in this country. And these decisions, the final decisions, are not made by these experts. They are made by us, the political persons. And that's where the confusion ends, or starts and ends. If we were working with experts on these issues, we would come up with more rational decisions than we are having now. The personal interest of politicians is riding high. Most of the exporters of maize, of meal, meal are politicians. The suppliers of fertilizers are not the experts you have in government. It's the politicians and their friends in business. They are benefiting from that. The decisions are made right up at set house on who gets a contract to supply fertilizers. Who is giving the licenses for the export of maize and meal meal? It's not the technocrats in government. It's the politicians and their agents. It's not lack of expertise. It's not lack of knowledge. I meet a lot of these experts from government. I learn a lot from them all the time. If we can listen to them and we increase the participation of our people in these decisions, we'll come up with better decisions. We are not coming up with suboptimal decisions because there's no expertise. No, it's there. But we have rendered them impotent. We have rendered them useless. At a very high cost because they are paid the salary. We pay them to advise government. The politician is sometimes the least knowledgeable person. Mm -hmm. You can't amass knowledge in all fields so of at the, human endeavor. So at the backdrop of, you know, the UPND election was obviously um, the huge, you know, debt crisis. And uh, last week when the Ministry of Finance alongside the World Bank and the IMF held, you know, their quarterly town hall meeting, it was revealed again that even our debt position has, you know, gone higher. But one of the things the UPND administration boast of is obviously the intent that was arrived at you know with the IMF pending the final details of the multi and bilateral you know debt restructuring negotiations where they were going haircut and so on which saw the release of the 188 million um, what is there that you can talk about from a socialist perspective 
that we need to be happy about with that status quo of achieving that IMF you know, deal? Look, the most important thing is moving out of this debt trap completely. This debt trap still hangs over our, our heads. The UPND has not gotten us out of a debt trap. We can write off all the debts as we did in the early 2000s, when the Jubilee 2000, led by the Catholics, negotiated or lobbied or campaigned for a debt write off. We got 100% write off. We are back in debt again. We can blame this regime, that regime. Some of the things are beyond the end of the regime. This issue is beyond even UPND. The debt trap is there. If we continue on this path, we'll be back again in the same situation. And the next government will be casing the UPND for putting up the debt high. We are in a debt trap. The economic order that we exist in as a poor country puts us in a debt trap. The debt trap is not necessarily with China, as it was being said, or somebody else. 70% of our debt lies with the people who have perpetually put us in a debt trap. This is the economic order we live in. The poor countries are failing to come out of debt. So it's how, not only how should we be approaching the stock? That's why they were meeting in South Africa, under the BRICS. What are they seeking? They are seeking for a more fair, more just, more humane economic order. The current economic order puts us in a difficult situation. It doesn't give us a chance. Look, for more than 60 years or 70 years, which African country has broken through economically? Which Latin American country has broken through economically? You can talk of Ghana, you can talk of Rwanda. What is there? How many times over the last 60 years have we had Ghana being an example of this and that? The next thing, it collapses. It collapses. Is it by accident? Are all these peoples of Africa there and their leaders fools, less intelligent human beings, including our, our relatives in Latin America? and in the, part, in the poor part of Asia. Do you say this because obviously as a socialist movement you seemingly align more to the Latins and the, pe the, the Latinos and the people in, in, in East Asia? Because obviously your theories have been very clear that you are anti-capitalist as, as, as a socialist. Look, we have lived under the capitalist order. Mm. To, th to this very day, capitalism dominates the world economic order. <clears throat> what have we gained from it? We have moved from being commodities on the capitalist market. We were bought and sold as human beings. Did it benefit our communities? More than 500 million Africans were shipped to the Americas. Did that trade improve our conditions? Our minerals are being, take, are being taken every day, but we are getting poorer. Those who are getting our minerals get a better deal from them. Whatever we have done with our capitalist friends or relatives, we have ended up being poorer. There has been mining on the copper belt since the early 1920s. What have we gotten out of it? What have the Lamba people gotten out of it? There's mining in northwestern province today. It has been going on for some time now. What have we gotten out of it? What are our Kawonde Lunda's relatives of ours? Shouldn't we be blaming it? ourselves more than blaming the capitalists? Yes, we have to find a solution because ourselves. Because God blessed us with those resources, we fought for liberation, we fought for independence. We've been governing ourselves, Doc, over the last 55 years. Yes, that's why we why want to take... Why should we be blaming We are not blaming anybody, we want to take responsibility. Mm. We are taking responsibility, we have to liberate ourselves. If somebody steals from you all the time, 
you are not going to cry about the thief stealing. You are going to put up measures to ensure that the thief does not come to sue from you. You still believe that we are neo-colonized? And, and the imperialists it, are the ones running it, it is a fact. Mm. It is a fact. Costa, today your financial system in Zambia, you only own and you control 5% of it. 95% of your financial sector is externally controlled. It's externally controlled. And what is that financial sector using? They are using your money, your government's money, your taxes to make money. Do they lend that money to you? No. Do our businessmen have access to that finance? No. Yes, they'll pick a few comprados, help them with this and that, they start to feel they're doing better than everybody else, they're smarter than everybody else. If we don't gain control of our economic activities, have our own businessmen carry out the business activities that are needed in all sectors of our lives, be it in mining, be it in finance, and so on. We are going nowhere. We cannot depend on other people forever. You talk and about, saying, you know, mm, depending on other people has not helped mm, us. It's not turning mm, against you, the other people. You, you talk about equity, fairness, and justice as part of your manifesto drive as, as a socialist you know, movement. And I know that uh, uh, you, you're friends of, 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 of the Chinese Communist Party. You were in Russia recently. When I analyze, correct me if I'm wrong, what is happening even out of the BRICS meeting in South Africa. It's like we're at a cusp again of a, of a new economic world order. But sadly enough, for certain and most parts of Africa, it's only South Africa that is part of this BRICS. Most of us are just passengers, the same way we're not recognized on the UN big boys table of the Security Council. We're not recognized on whether it's the G8 or the G20, you know, name it. Is this not merely a second scramble for Africa where the big powerful boys, Brazil, Russia, India, and China now are coming to sort of befriend us and alienate the West who enslaved us? Nobody is alienating anybody. The world will not be saved by having small blocks here, blocks there, blocks there. No. What is needed is a fair world for everybody. I've said before that this planet is not going to be good for any of us if it's not good enough for all of us. We are all traveling on this same vessel called planet Earth. And this planet Earth, we are traveling on this vessel, carries with it so many inequalities. We have others traveling in luxurious cabins. We have others traveling in the hold. But we are all going to the same destination. With these inequalities, with these contradictions, with these injustices, this vessel is bound to hit an iceberg. And if it does, nobody will survive. Those in the luxurious cabins and those in the hold will both not survive. Like it happened with, the, Titan argument, like it happened with the Titanic. But my argument, Dr. Member, is on the premise that there, there is, and again, you've been there longer, writing about most of these things when the Paris Club and many of these groups, the World Bank and everybody, people have complained. You've just been saying it now that the type of help and the financial solutions they give when you give examples of Ghana and so on, they're a bit fictitious or, or, or temporary. And, and there's been this debate among you know, uh, developed and developing countries, where which aid is better? Is it one coming from the East with China that doesn't have any conditionalities attached with it, or another that comes with conditionalities attached? So it's it's who should we be dealing with? Who's who's better? That's where I'm premising my argument upon. No, look, institutions are created for a purpose. You created this station, television station, for a purpose. The IMF, the World Bank, were created for a purpose. And those who create something own that something. When the World Bank and the IMF were being created, we were not countries. We were not countries. We were colonies. We were not states. We were territories. 
belonging to those who created the World Bank, those who created the IMF. It was an economic, a new economic order they were creating at that time to take care of their own interests, not to take care of us. We joined them in 1965 after independence, hoping we would get something that would help us to develop. We are still going north. So would we say the creation of such a world order has outlived its purpose under the current conditions in 2023? Does it, no. does it serve no, to benefit look, us? Well? You can't develop by trying to decorate your tomorrows with other people's yesterdays. You can't develop by just following other people's tales. We need to take control of our own destiny. That's what I'm saying. Let's do things our own way. All paths are different. There are no paths that are the same. The conditions of each country are different. They cannot be a straight jacket. Even the way this country should be governed should be different from all others because we are different. You've been a strong critic as far as our international relations are concerned to the extent that you describe President Hitchcock as running a puppetry, you know, administration, puppet, you know, to, you know, the West. Um, what is wrong with dealing with all international players equally, as this administration is saying? I mean, we are part of the membership of the IMF and the World Bank, and we're dealing with them. President Hitchcock is scheduled to have a state you know, visit to China any time, you know, in the coming few weeks. He was at the BRICS, you know, summit in South Africa, even if we're not members. But we are, to say, nine aligned, but working with everybody. But you, you strongly accuse him of running a puppetry type of government. Yeah, I'm about to say it's a type. We are a sovereign country. And that sovereignty is being challenged today. We have established an office here of AFRICOM, the African Command of the United States Armed Forces. For what and for who? The AAU, when that project started in 2008, opposed it. Sadiki opposed it. You go to State House today, you have the Tony Blair Institute operating there. The Brentes Foundation of Greg Mills, owned by Anglo, financed by Anglo, by the Oppenheimers, plays a big role in your policies today. You look at your policies today, the tilt. I'm not saying don't deal with other people. There's no country in the world that can solve all its problems by itself, including the United States. What, we all need each other. One, one then but would, would, the, difference be, mm, go ahead. the difference between a puppet and the one who is cooperating with the others is you take your own decisions. But wouldn't it be right then, Dr. Member, to say, just like you, you, you said before, that institutions or ideologies are created or one believes in a certain path. So if, if, if what you're saying is true, and, and probably those are the ideologies that the president aligns with, it's, it's, not it's, even it's, a, it's as good as what you align with yourself it's not even as a, a socialist person with other people in the world who, who you align with. It's not even a question of ideology. It's not even a question of who you align with. That's not the issue. The issue is what is the best for our people. We have been through this path that this government is pursuing, is taking us to. We have been through it from 1891 when we were colonized by John Cecil Rhodes and his BSA company. We are not even colonized by the British government. Our first colonizer was a company, a businessman and his company. They ran they this country, this territory for 33 years. 
33 years we were under the rule of a company and this owner from 1891 to 1924, when the British Foreign Office took over, up to 1964. We have run our economy on the basis of the Western doctrines, on the Western prescriptions, the capitalist prescriptions, up to date. If we have not succeeded economically, socially, and otherwise, it's not because we did not run our country on a capitalist basis. That's what we have run. Mm. If this is beneficial to our people, if this will deliver what it has failed to deliver since 1891, let's pursue it. But allow me to take advantage of simple conclusions. You know, Dr. Membe, as I look at uh, the back and forth in terms of how especially the UPND sympathizers as well as the supporters of President Hitchlema respond to some of you know the things you say or the attacks you give the president. Some believe that you are more personal in attacking the president than being just a political rival. I want to take advantage of asking you this: What is your personal relationship like with President? You know. I know that uh, during your days uh, at the Post, many again said you played a huge role, influence, um, with some of these presidents coming into power. You had a very good relationship with President Mwanawasa. You had a, a relationship that we've discussed here with President Sata and how you fell out. What has been your interaction with President Hitler? My Anything personal? Look, M my way both as a journalist and as a political person today, has nothing to do with one individual in Zambia. It has nothing to do with one individual in Zambia. I had participation that dates back to my school days. The people are playing politics today, some of them, yes, I know them. A lot, a lot more, I don't know them, they are new. I don't need a personal relationship with anyone to participate in the affairs of my country. And no one needs a personal relationship with me to participate in the affairs of this country. Mr. Kainde H. Lema only came into the politics of this country in 2006, as far as the records can show. Only in 2006. I was there much longer than that. I joined the South African Communist Party in 1978. I joined the African National Congress in 1978. Mr. Hichilema was not there. I didn't know any other politician there in Zambia that I dealt with at that time. So it has got nothing to do with my personal relationship. And how many parties are there? In Zambia today, do I need to build a relationship? How with you them? and President Hitchlema differed on anything at any point? I don't know him. Why can I differ with the person? I don't know. I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't have any dealings with him. I've never been his business associate. He was not in the political organizations that I belonged to. He played no civic role mm. in terms of politics. The only time I came to know of him in any social sense was when he became UPN, he started aspiring for UPND president. The Post, the Post newspaper then was influential with so many political you know, platforms. Uh, I remember the arguments of um, President Sata saying, you know, the Post won't sell if I'm not in the headline, but eventually again you made up and so on. Unless I'm mistaken, there was a time when President Hichilema then in the opposition had um, an interaction with the Post newspapers and yourself then as a political player. We covered everybody. Mm. The newspaper covered everybody who had something to say, not only those in politics, but also in business, in civic organizations. How far so did your influence as a paper go? I don't know. <laughs> it's, I can ask you the same question. Mm. You are a journalist. You are an editor of this uh, television station. 
how far does your influence go? I don't know. And do we do it for influence? No. Our job as journalists was to seek news, to seek the views of other people, process them and transmit them, repeated. And that's, I believe also that's what you're doing. You have called me here for an interview to seek my views and to transmit them to the people so that they can know what other people think, what I think as a leader of the Socialist Party. Do you have influence on what people believe about what I'm saying or not? No. That's not your job. To make people believe me, no, it's not your job. Your job is to give me a platform in an organized way, in a professional way. Ask the right questions to me and seek the explanation that I needed from me. The Post did that. We carried out what people said. We sought what people thought and transmitted it. There were people who were not even part of the post writing columns. We didn't tell them what to write. They wrote those columns. The newspaper came out with its editorial comment. As you do also, you come out with a, one of some of the best editorial comments that I, I listen to in this country or read. I enjoy them. Do they influence me? Yes, they do. Do they explain certain things to me? Yes, they do. And I need the views of other people. I need to listen to as many views as possible as I can. So media diversity is important. Political pluralism is also important. We need more views. We need more voices. Is it an enmity if one has this view and the other one has got that other view? We should all belong to the same television station. There should be only one television station in Zambia. If there are 10, 15 television stations, then they are enemies of, of each other. If there are 20 newspapers, then they are enemies of each other. If there are 10, 20, 50 political parties, then they are enemies of each other. We have to learn to live with diversity. We need to respect the positions of other people. Disagreeing with somebody is not an enmity. Having a contrary view to what one has is not an enmity. Look at how many Christian churches we have in this country today. Churches that call themselves Christian. Look at the number. Are they fighting each other? Are they enemies with each other? They don't need to exist in that diversity. We should only have one church because we are praying one God. So there's something wrong with us by having so many Christian churches. We suffered that in Chesari in the late 50s. One of my relatives started a church, a Christian church. They were fought by the churches that existed then. They were fought by the colonial authorities. They were even fought by the National Liberation Movement. You know the Lenshima Church? We have to conclude on that score. Thank you so much, as always, for coming through to COST, and uh, we hope to engage and interact more. Uh, and uh, thank you for weighing in on the various issues tonight. Thank you very much. This is DJ Mutati Exclusive. Alright, that's all right for you today, lovely viewers. If you did enjoy the video, please don't forget to leave a comment in the comment section below. Tell me what you think about the video you just watched in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you, lovely viewers. Once again, I go by the name of Mutatim Pondum. I love you, peace. I gotta go.